culture we have in Red Lantern Analytica. Red Lantern Analytica is an international affairs observer group based out of New Delhi, India. It focuses on critical issues related to China with special focus on Sino-India relations, issues of national security, international security, energy, and environment. The main aim of the organization is to draw in India's foremost academic institutions and security intelligentsia, corporate institutions, monetary establishments, and experts in discussion on India's foreign policy, and to extend the country's role in global issues. So this was a brief introduction about Red Lantern Analytica. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the session to today's moderator, Mr. Sindhu. He is a research scholar and development practitioner. He will be carrying forward today's session. Over to you, Mr. Sindhu. Thank you, Sanjana. Uh, good evening to all of us present here and good morning from the perspective of the speakers, of course. I am Sindhu and I offer a warm welcome to all of you in this webinar hosted by Red Lantern Analytica. The topic that is going to be discussed today is the CCP's Uyghur genocide and diplomatic boycott of Beijing Winter Olympics. Even though this topic needs no introduction perhaps, allow me to say a few lines before I pass on the mantle to our speakers. <laughs> we live in a society that is continually and fra frequently fragmented by violence. For some, the presence of violence in our innate nature is testament to the fact that humans are, after all, not above animals. However, nothing justifies the crackdown of violence and ethnic genocide that is being faced by the Uyghur community in Northwest China. It is in the light of these events that we are gathered here today to hear some of prominent speakers on the matter. For this discussion, we have with us today Mr. Ilshad Hassan Kokbore, Dr. Erkin Siddiq, Ms. Julie Millsap Liu, and Mr. Jivlan Shirmamet. I welcome Mr. Ilshad Hassan Kokbore uh, for the first uh, speech of the day. Mr. Ilshad was born in Gulja, East Turkestan and is currently serving as the Vice Chairman of the World Uyghur Congress of Executive Committee and the Chinese Cultural Consultant of Uyghur Human Rights Project. Due to political prosecution, he had to flee from his fatherland to Malaysia, leaving behind his parents and family. In 2007, he joined the Uyghur American Association. Since then, Mr. Ilshad has gained prominence as a very active and influential figure in Uyghur human rights campaign. Over to you, Mr. Kukbore. Thank you, Sindhu. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the Red Lantern Analytica for organizing uh, this event. It is very important, as you all mentioned. Uh, we are suffering as a uh, Uyghur, and uh, this suffering is already lasted very, very long. Uh, a lot of time when we think of the genocide, it seems uh, to a lot of audience, it was just happened starting from 2017. Actually, it was far longer than that. Since the Chinese occupation in East Turkestan, uh, I would mention in here, uh, before the Chinese occupation of East Turkestan and Tibet, China never had bordered with India, and India never had any threat from the Chinese empire. And since the occupation, we are suffering, and also the Southeast Asia, India, and others, all is under the Chinese communist threat. And starting from my personal, since 2000, the Chinese government, after the 9-11, labeled the Uyghur as, because of our Muslim background, labeled as a terrorist, separatist. Any grievance shown uh, to the government from Uyghur side, all labeled as a terrorist action, and killed, jailed, 
our intellectuals was get arrested uh, and all of our books censored. And this was keep going on. That's why when I was a associate professor in a college and I started to show my refuel, uh, resistance to the Chinese uh, assimilation, and they started labeling me as a separatist. And after I was arrested a few times, uh, tortured in the interrogation, my teeth was uh, broken because of their beating. And also they used electric uh, baton to electrify me. So I had to leave. And in 2003, I left, fled to Malaysia. In 2004, because the Chinese government find out I'm already fled, and they instigated the Chinese mob to kill my younger brother. He was killed in a daylight in a restaurant uh, at the early morning. And until now, because when I fled, I was on rush. I don't want anyone to find out. So I didn't say goodbye to my younger brother. When he was stabbed to death, he was just 27 years old. I lost him forever. Never had a chance to say goodbye to him. And I came to U.S. in 2006 as a refugee. Starting that point, I continued my activism, calling for the human rights, for the dignity of the Uyghur people, the equal rights of the Uyghur people. I write in Chinese, I give speech, and then in 2014, 15th of August, the Chinese security break into my elder sister's house at midnight, she was a single mother with two kids. Since then, my elder sister got lost. I don't know if she is still alive. I don't know about her two kids, if they are still alive or in jail or in concentration camp. And 2016, April, 15th of April, my father, he couldn't bear more the trauma, sisters arrest, brothers killing, made him, his health worsened and then he passed away uh, in 2016, uh, 5th of April. After my last call with my mother, until that time, I was having once a call with my parents. Just ask them, are you okay? And they will say, yeah, son, we are okay. Just hang up the phone. That was always my father's word. Hang up the phone. We are okay. God bless you. And then in uh, after my father passed away uh, in 2016, August, I had my last call with my mother. My mother told me, son, we had enough. Because of you, all of your nieces, cousins, they can't get job, and uh, your sister, they are all have no job, no income. We are having too much, too much. So please don't call us. God bless you. That was my mother's last word. Since then, I got lost with my mother. Now she is almost, if she is still alive, she is almost 80 years old. I don't know if she is alive if she is in concentration camp or in jail. I tried to call many times. No one answered the phone. Sometimes a Chinese lady speaking and uh, say this number is not existed. And I tried my Chinese dissident friend, ask them to find out my mother. One guy even went to from other province to East Turkestan, my mother's city where she lived, but she, uh, he couldn't find out my mother. And so I don't know. This is my story. And in 2018, from New Yorker Journal, I learned my another two sister with her husband and their kids in a concentration camp. 
and I tried my best to contact with the one lady. She is now in living in Europe to find out what happened to my sister because that lady was together with my sister for a while in that concentration camp before she uh, was released. She is a Kazakh lady. And I called her, I got her phone number, and she told me a few heartbreaking stories. Each time when I'm thinking of it, it's very difficult. And she told me, my second sister with her husband, with her daughter in that concentration camp, and my second sister have heart problem. A few times she was passing out in that flag raising or the Chinese meeting. And uh, her daughter, her husband tried to get her, help her, but the police not allowing and dragging my sister out from that scene. And you imagine your husband or your daughter's kids watching you passing out can't help, and they are dragging it out. What is the feeling? And I am, when I'm hearing that, it immediately always come to my mind is my brother. I was always asking myself, when my brother was killed by the Chinese mob, stabbed to death in that restaurant, is he called, brother, where are you? Can you help me? If my sister is calling, brother, can you help me? Save us. It's always in my mind. It's not something far away. Even though I'm living in the United States, I am having a decent job. I'm enjoying the freedom, but I am in concentration camp. And spiritually and physically. I can't enjoy any happiness. I was yesterday reading the Auschwitz, Auschwitz survivor, Italian uh, Plymo Levis book about uh, surviving Auschwitz. And in one paragraph, he quoted another one survivor. Once you are in the torture and the suffering, forever you will be in that torturing and with that suffering, because you can't get rid of it. You can't out from that. We are in that torture, that trauma. We are all in here, all over. We, everyone in US, in Turkey, you will hear Jolan Shirmamet's story later, and in Europe, most of us, have the same story. Someone's father was dead in the concentration camp. Someone's mother was disappeared in daylight. And we don't know. This is a genocide. And it's ongoing. And it, less than a week, we'll be in Beijing, the 2022 Olympic. And the International Olympic Committee with his president, Mr. Buck, refusing to re relocate or cancel this Olympic, giving the Chinese government, as giving in 1936 to the Nazi German, a chance to show their power, show their achievement, giving them the legitimacy. Now, the International Olympic Com Committee giving the China next. In 2008, they gave once. Now they are giving second chance for them to legitimize their genocide, their rule, their brutal rule. It's not only Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Konger, Chinese, Taiwan, and even India is under their threat constantly. Like this, an authoritarian government will, will in next week, we will see in the opening ceremony, a bunch of happy weaver will sing and dance. So the world, 
so that dignitary like dictator Putin, like the journalist killer Mohammed bin Salman, like the rogue corrupted politician Imran Khan sitting over there seeing this whitewashing of the genocide, making a grandeur fanfare for the communist government. This is shameful for the humanity, for all of us, because we are suffering. I'm a United States American citizen. I'm proud of my country, but I can't watch this Olympic because everything in that Olympic tainted by my brother's blood, my sister's freedom, my mother's disappearance, and also some others in here, they will tell the same story. We can't sit in here in silent. Like in 1936, giving the Nazi German a chance to continue its Holocaust. Now the Chinese government is copying the Nazi German, using this fanfare, not only to whitewash, and also to show to this world how they are strong, how powerful they are, how rich they are. But in the same time, the Chinese people, the Hong Konger, the Tibetan, and the Uyghur, they are. And also the Chinese people, they are suffering. They have no voice in this. No voice in this. No any enjoyment with this Olympic. Why should it be held in this country? When a genocide, 21st century, a shame happening in there. And we are having this Olympic. So I call all humanity, I call my friends, all fellow human being in India, in all over the world, stand up, say no to this Olympic. We still have a few days. We can, in a few days, we can achieve a lot. I trust, I always believe in our civilization, in our humanity, in our conscience. If we stand up, come together in this few days, we can change the world. We can make up, make the uh, miracle. This is our power, people's power, if we use it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Kubbore. Uh, for a very moving account of your experiences and for pro providing us with your perspective on this matter. Next with us is Dr. Erkin Siddiq. Dr. Erkin Siddiq was born in the city of Aksu in East Turkestan, located in the northwestern part of China. From early 2018, Dr. Siddiq gave lectures in the US and around the world on the current Uyghur tragedies and Chinese government's genocide of the Uyghurs in both Uyghur language and in English. In June 2019, Dr. Siddiq founded Uyghur Projects Foundation, a non-profit organization registered in the US with a group of Uyghur professionals to preserve the language, culture, and the ethnic identity of Uyghurs in diaspora. Since 2018, Dr. Siddiq has also been serving as the senior advisor for World Uyghur Congress. I welcome you, Dr. Siddiq, to present your speech. Thank you very much for your introduction and this uh, opportunity. It was, I am so grateful about that. Um, 
as I was, as I just said, I was born in Aksu Prefecture, and I finished my elementary, middle, high school in Aksu, and went to college in Urumqi, which is the capital of East Turkestan. Uh, electrical engineering major, I studied five years and learned three languages: Chinese, English, and Japanese. I became a university teacher. Went to Japan first. After that, I came to U.S. in 1988, and I have been living in the United States since then. Um, I still have three siblings back home, and I never made a single phone call to them since January of 2017, because I was at the top top uh, position of the Chinese blacklist, and anybody who contacts me or, or I contact, they will be taken away uh, to concentration camps or jail, and uh, I haven't talked to them since 2017. I didn't visit our homeland uh, since 2009. I visited three times in 2006, uh, 7, and 2009, and I met uh, with more than 1,000 college students. And uh, meeting with me or contacting with me became a crime after 2017. So all the college students are gone. They disappeared. Uh, that's why uh, I am doing what I'm doing now. I was not political originally. I was a very academic, uh, trying to help young people about uh, personal development, goal setting, those kind of things. But uh, our current situation forced me to do that. This is one picture uh, from 2009 with college students. Um, in this picture, you see two people. The red shirt is my um, middle school, high school Uyghur literature teacher. He was, uh, he was arrested in 2018 and died in a concentration camp at the age of 78. He was a teacher before, later on he became the uh, principal of the mid middle high school, but he died. The other person, the white shirt, um, <clears throat> Abbas Monias, he's a, uh, the middle school teacher, initially later became professional writer, wrote more than 20 books. He was arrested in 2017 and sentenced to 17 years prison. Um, the, this person, Mutalib um, Nurmamat on the on my uh, other side, uh, he came to US to study. Uh, he studied five years, got two master degrees, and they went back. But he was arrested in 2018, stayed in a concentration camp for about nine months. After that, he was released, but died. But died eight days later in a hospital. The reason is internal bleeding. And uh, I had another person, I, I, could, I couldn't get a picture of it, but um, his name is Erkin Siddiq. He was a, a one electrical vocational school teacher in Urumqi. He was taken in a, with a group of people to Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand in 2015 for a trip. When he came back, uh, he was arrested at Beijing airport. The reason is because his name is Erkin Siddiq, same as me. That means the airport keeping my name or picture in the airport, in the custom, and he was arrested. The lead of the team was a Chinese, the university principal, or the school principal. He, the, he did the explanation, saying it's not a reconsidered in, in the U.S., in NASA. This is different. This is my teacher. He's a good guy. But they said, it's none of your business. And they tortured him three days, integrated him, and he released him to back to Urumqi. But he died one week later. I can go on and go on like this. Uh, every year I travel around the world, the only thing I hear is the mourning of the people. Every family lost many, many people. Uh, that's the situation. And uh, I want to uh, make two points very quickly. The first one is uh, Uyghur people abroad, trust me. So whoever gets some very important information about uh, the situation back home, uh, they send it to me. So I'm kind of center of, of information. I get, I live like that every week with the new information about what's going on. And uh, also from the, uh, uh, the East Turkestan, the, the party's central government in East Turkestan, also the central government official in, of the Chinese central government as well. So I have got a lot of information. Uh, I can, I want to tell you some numbers very quickly to, to show you the sheer size of the genocide, uh, what's going on in East Turkestan. Um, <clears throat> Since 2014, about 1.8 million people Uyghurs transferred from concentration camp to prisons. 1.8 million. 
2.1 million Uyghurs were transferred from concentration camps to other parts of China. They were used for bioweapon experiments, for <coughs> uh, the organ harvesting, uh, and also murdered. There are some uh, reports by Peter Winter, you can look it up. And uh, it is the, basically the Chinese government took those people not to keep them alive, 2.1 million people. So let them die as soon as possible. I called them, I called it as a distributed mass murder. In the past, when people did, did the murdering, mass murdering, they, they dig a ditch and buried them. So people could find, find out later on. But China is very smart. Chinese are very smart. They just do a distributed way at night and nobody can find out. But uh, we are losing very large number of people. And since 2014, about 1 million Uyghurs were murdered or died because of the hardship and the torture, mental and the physical hardship or uh, torture. Um, we have another about 4 million people right now in concentration camps and uh, forced labor factories. The Uyghur Projects Foundation, uh, we hired some people to, to get information about the uh, forced labor factories in East Turkestan. We got a detailed information when, this, when the factory was built, how many employees, kind of. The list includes 14,000 factories in East Turkestan alone. Imagine if each factory uses 100 Uyghurs as forced labor workers, we are talking about 1.4 million. In reality, all of those factories are much bigger than that. So we have a huge number of people in forced labor factories right now. And those people, the male and female separated, and they cannot go home at night, work 12 hours a day. So it likes a prison as well. Um, so if you add these numbers up, it's about 9 million. I got this 9 million figure from a top official in a police department in Urumqi, Xinjiang Police Department, since 2014. So the Western uh, media still uses more than 1 million. That's not true. I brought up the more than 1 million in November of 2017. I met a person who came from Urumqi to, to, to the United States. I met with him personally. He, he gave me some information about a secret meeting. The government announcing that that year, in 2017, in one year, the government uh, arrested uh, more than 800,000 Uyghurs. I, talk, I gave this information to, to Human Rights Watch and they published, they published an article in, in January of 2018. See, the one million, this figure came out in the media in January of 2018. The size of the concentration camp doubled, tripled after that, and people still say more than one million. Now, there's one question. How come so many people can be arrested? The Chinese government only is, uh, has been saying, like a, a two weeks ago, the foreign minister spokesman said there were 11.6 million Uyghurs in Xinjiang in, in 2021. But the real number is, is not like that. It's not 11 million. The Chinese government keeps the population number as a, as a top secret. Even the population number of Han Chinese is not correct. They hide the number. My wife worked at, at, uh, as a teacher at Xinjiang University in the computer center. Her major is computer science. In 1990, when the China conducted a census, the, the computer center participated in the in crunching the numbers. But at a very at the last phase, all the non Han staff were dismissed. They are not allowed to see the final number. This is how China operates. So the Uyghur population is about 20 million. There is a U.S. Uh, general, retired U.S. general Wilkerson. You can look up, look it up in Google. In 2018, he said there are 20 million Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. I trust this number. So the 20 million Uyghurs know the Chinese government saying 11.6 million. So we are talking about more than 8 million people missing. So I, I, I just told you what happened to those people. The real situation is so sad. The, the loss came that we got, the Uyghur people got, is more than, than the Holocaust right now. But the world does not know it. And uh, so far, the, nobody went there and investigate. I hope I, I am wrong, but the real situation is so bad. 
Another situation is the living people, how they are living. You see, the, about one million kids were separated from parents. Just imagine you have a child, daughter or girl, three or four years old. Government took them. You can only see once a week or once a month, or if you are in the concentration camp, you can never see them again. How do you feel? Can you be a new normal human being after that? Do you care if you're alive or dead? This is the situation that the whole Uyghur population in Turkestan is under right now. That's the situation. <clears throat> let me briefly just uh, let me see how much time I have. Briefly mention to you why China is doing what it is doing to the Uyghur people. Uh, many people talk about uh, from the religious background. Of course, the phase was the number one uh, crime in China. So the first first phase of the people were arrested, all are religious people who prayed five times a day. And the second phase are the people who have contacted me or meet with me. I am at the very top list. All the people who contact me are gone. So I was a um, university teacher at Xinjiang University. She wrote me an email asking for, for the PDF uh, file of one book that I published. I sent her the book. She was arrested and sentenced to 15 years to prison. Just one email. How I learned that? Her brother is in Japan. I wanted to testify about her in Uyghur tribunal, but his brother rejected reason. Their son is in, in China's, China's custody. They cannot get their son out if they speak out. That's the situation. Um, so the what the China, why China is doing what it is doing right now? The main is there are five reasons. The number one reason is in 1990, Soviet Union collapsed. The, one of the main reasons is Soviet Union kept all the uh, non-Russian people or minorities uh, in, in their own land. They preserved the language, culture, religion, everything. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, all those republics became independent. China learned a lesson. This is their biggest fear since then, saying we cannot keep the minorities alone, separately. So China decided to have only one race. They called Zhonghua Minzo, Chinese race, eliminate all the minorities. If you look at Chinese official documents, they always say there are 56 minorities in China. In reality, they are all gone, assimilated, get rid of it. Right now, only the Uyghurs and the Tibets are left, and the China are after them as well. That's the number one reason. Number two, the One Road, One Belt Initiative. There are two major land roads for this project. And uh, one of them passed through East Turkestan. It starts from Xi'an, passes through East Turkestan, go to Central Asia and the Turkey to Africa. Two of them starts in East Turkestan. One starts from East Turkestan and go to Wadar port in Pakistan. Another one starts from East Turkestan, go to Central Asia and Europe. So for this project to be successful, China needed a stable environment. And they always thought Uyghurs as a threat for this initiative. So what they did to the Uyghur people is a final solution for stability. This is the number two reason. Number three reason that China always uh, afraid that uh, one day China may go to war with the US. If that happens, US can airdrop weapons to, in East Turkestan, weaponize the Uyghur people, and Uyghur people will fight with the US against China. There's a Chinese general called Dei Xu. He's a professor at China National University. Also, he's a senior advisor to the Chinese central government. He did a survey from 2009 to 2011 in East Turkestan. And after he finished the survey, he gave a presentation at, at his university. There is a YouTube video of his speech, two hours long. At that speech, he says, the Chinese government has been saying the number one threat is the terrorism. It's bullshit. Actually, it's not like that. Actually, the number one threat is the Uyghur population. In Kashgar and Khotan, 95% of the population are Uyghurs. If one day the China fights with the US, US can arm 
easily three hundred to five hundred thousand Uyghur men, and those men will fight alongside the U.S. against China. I will this problem until to the end. I will not rest into solving this problem. So what you see right now is a solution to that problem. Seventy percent of the males in Khotan and the Kashgar prefecture are gone. Seventy percent. That's number three reason. Number four, the China needs land and uh, natural resources, but not human life, not humans. They have oversupply. Just look at right now what's going on in Xi'an, Tianjin, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, with the Winter Olympic thing and with the, with the quarantine, what's going on? For China, human life means nothing. They don't care. Uyghur population is 20 million. When China conducts census, the census area is more than 20 million. So 20 million population means nothing for them. Mao Zedong killed about 45 million people during the Cultural Revolution from 1965 to 1975. You can look it up. So the Uyghur people, this is the number four region. Number five is the opportunity. China raised up economically and they bought out all the governments around the world. Including, including the international institutions like the uh, United States. United States, I was told there are 15 or 16 committees, and the head of the seven committees are Chinese, from China. So the, the UN is dysfunctional, does not work anymore. And the World Trade Organization, same thing. World, World Health Organization, same thing. So the China see an opportunity to do this openly, and that's what they are doing. So uh, um, all the Uyghurs abroad now, we became crybaby. We lost so much. Like I have, I have many hundred relatives. I don't know who is alive, who is not, and who is in concentration camps because I cannot contact them. Uh, this is the world we are living. And uh, Uyghur people love social life. Um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, performances on YouTube. I cannot watch that kind of YouTube anymore because I started to cry. Everything about Uyghurs are gone. Language, culture, custom, religion, you name it. Nothing. The, the February 1st is the Chinese uh, Spring Festival. I am getting a lot of videos right now every day. Uh, Uyghur people dancing. Uyghur people are forced to dance Chinese, Han Chinese dance. You cannot see single Uyghur dance. All the Uyghur dance classes are eliminated, even from the art schools. So this is a situation. It's happening in the 21st century. And uh, we have condemnation, criticism, and the uh, U.S. came up with several bills. But it's all not helping. The, the, the pressure, China does not care about the pressure. They didn't change their plan. They didn't slow down. But they are speeding up the pace. The, I got one piece of information uh, which says Xi Jinping decided in 2014 to kill one third of the Uyghurs, lock up one third of the Uyghurs, and uh, convert the remaining one third into automatons or people who live who are living in the in the Middle Ages, and that's what you see right now. Uh, the one third of the Uyghur population is about six to seven million. So at the end. You can expect only six to seven million Uyghurs will live, but they will be converted to automatons. They only receive orders. They act based on the orders, not on their own. Human being like that. That's what we are heading. I don't know when the, US, the international community takes actions, but uh, what they will find is horrible. It's more, worse than Holocaust, and but this is 21 century, and uh, it has been uh, seven, more than 70 years from World War II, and the, the world is still allowing this to happen, and, they are, and even rewarding the, the China with the Winter Olympic. It's a stain of the century. It's the stain of the humanity. The China will not stop with Uyghurs. For China, all other races is a foreign races, subhuman. Just look up China's history books. They call other races subhumans. Only the Han Chinese are the full human. This is how they looked at other races in the past. And still it, it's rooted deeply in their culture. And that's what we are, we are facing today. 
and the, the world will face again. Uh, you can see that from the world, the one who wrote, one built initiative, the China should be stopped. Otherwise, we are expecting a world that's not recognizable by the current human being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Siddiq, for presenting the facts and numbers that in fact paint a very grim picture of the reality. We also thank you for presenting your perspectives on the political motives of the matter. I'm sure it will be taken up by your audiences at the end of this discussion. Our next guest is Ms. Julie Millsap Liu, who is an advocate for Uyghur human rights. She has spent a considerable amount of time in China, and after witnessing the growing atrocities against Uyghurs, she began advocating for equal Uyghur rights. Her background is in political science and education management. Over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, um, and thank you to Red Lantern Analytica for hosting this today and also for the work that you have been doing consistently to bring awareness to this issue, um, particularly for Indian audiences. We're very appreciative of that. So, you know, I think it's pretty hard to add to what's already been said. I think this has set such an incredible picture for the audience of why it's absolutely preposterous that at this point in time, Beijing is hosting the Olympics yet again. Um, I did have the experience of being uh, in China for the 2008 Olympics, and it was clear at this point in time, China should not have been hosting. And since then, the situation has obviously only drastically devolved. And so what's incredibly disturbing about this all, again, is the uh, our response as the international community and how we have refused to learn um, from past mistakes. And um, so to give a little bit of context on international response thus far, you know, we have just recently heard a verdict even from the Uyghur Tribunal in London, again, confirming that the PRC is guilty of genocide. And so um, it's really a powerful reminder when we look at some of the things that have been done that where governments have failed to perform their duty, um, we're seeing more countries begin to join the diplomatic boycott. But, you know, this really was the bare minimum response to a genocidal regime hosting the Olympics. And so it's been left to the people to kind of step in and put pressure and draw attention even to the ways that the IOC is corrupt in the same way that it has been left to the people a lot of times to put um, pressure on the governments to act where they should. And so for a lot of our governments, they're still failing to fully recognize um, the threat that the situation presents. This is a human crisis. It should concern anyone uh, with a conscience. But beyond that, the implications of allowing China to get away with genocide and allowing the IOC to continue with these types of corrupt behavior um, have enormous uh, dangerous implications for the entire international community. And so just as a reminder for the audience, you know, it is left to us to remind, to provoke, uh, to fully realize um, the gift of the freedoms that we do have, but also protecting our own national sovereignty by calling out what is happening right now. I think that it is difficult a lot of times for people to fully grasp that something so evil could really be happening. Um, we're still seeing that uh, the average citizen in many of our respective countries is, is sheltered from the realities of what is happening. Um, and we're kind of being conditioned to accept that China is the way that it is. Um, and that's, that's really dangerous as well. So even with what we've observed in the last few years, uh, in my personal perspective, should be enough of a wake up call to the international community with what happened with COVID. And so um, obviously this is a nation that should not be hosting the Olympics. And we continue to have leaders in, um, in the international community choose to believe that, you know, human rights is not their lane or it's, it's, uh, it's really beyond appalling. And so we're seeing that Uyghurs obviously and beyond that, you know, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, Southern Mongolians, uh, and as Ilshat mentioned, you know, Chinese people themselves uh, are, their lives are treated as disposable. And so the dynamic between the international community and China has really been quite shocking. Um, I think a lot of times people are using a lot of language that is kind of presenting it as if, if we call for accountability or we call out these things, we're warmongering potentially. And uh, we really need to continue to call on people around the world to recognize that, uh, you know, it's 
China, the Chinese regime's actions are hostile. And so we need to continue to lend our voice on this issue. We have to re reiterate to the world that China is not a country ruled by law and cannot be while the Chinese Communist Party is in power. Um, it's not going to acknowledge human rights. It's not going to be on the same page. And the worldview of its leaders is so fundamentally different than the rest of the world, you know, that um, hostage taking behavior is normal. So just as we've heard already on the panel today, this is common behavior, taking family members and friends of, of people that speak out or are considered dissidents hostage is normal behavior that's openly defended. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, enough is enough. <laughs> we have to have this attitude. We might question how something so cool could be happening, but it is happening. And so um, we need to, to recognize that and move forward. So continuing to affirm this type of criminal behavior and the way that the IOC has done that uh, is, is not particularly surprising given the IOC's history. But what is, I think, shocking about it is with everything that's even come out in the last few months um, with disappearing a top athlete, with continuing to engage in this type of threatening behavior against international athletes that are traveling um, to the games. Again, these are all things that might have been predicted based on the response thus far from the Chinese authorities, but also from the IOC itself. And so um, I think what we're left to at this point in time is recognizing the IOC is not going to do the right thing. And nations have been slow to even agree to a diplomatic boycott. Many still have not. Um, is to do what we can to, to um, draw attention to the IOC's complicity and corruption leading up to the games, uh, to continue to use uh, the conversations surrounding it to raise awareness, and also to call on people around us to refuse to watch um, the Olympics. So, you know, being unable to commit to something so basic as a full boycott is extremely disappointing. And um, my personal perspective has always been, yes, it really, really is a terrible situation for athletes to be put in. Um, but again, that is the fault of the IOC for awarding Beijing the Olympics. And um, this is something where we're talking about a life and death situation. So it is unfortunate that we were having to call on athletes to um, refuse to attend the games or to use the games um, as, as a backdrop for um, raising these conversations. But this is reality. You know, Uyghurs are facing death. They are facing genocide, the loss of family members. So it goes beyond loss of career or loss of prestige. This is a truly atrocious situation. And so um, we need more. We have to continue to use at this point in time the games as, as a backdrop to call for the release of political prisoners to, to draw attention to the fact that it's ridiculous that Beijing's hosting the games again. Um, and so, again, we have to to make sure that as the international community, leadership has to be more than a slogan. It needs to be more than just a buzzword. Um, we have to be really resolute in, in a response to evil. And that starts with examining the ways that our own governments and the IOC have been complicit. And we have to continue um, to use this horrific moment in time with the Olympics to propel us forward and um, to do whatever it takes to end this evil this evil that's occurring. And I'm not going to take much more time because, again, I think that just by listening to the stories of Uyghurs themselves, and as we'll hear from Jevlon shortly, um, what's happening with, with um, his family, um, this is enough to compel the international community to act. It should convict every single person of the ways that we have failed and failed to recognize the threat that the Chinese regime is. Um, we have enough. If we were to isolate any of these instances that have been mentioned, that would be enough to demand that our um, governments take a stronger approach to China and decouple, let alone, you know, demanding that the Olympics be moved. Um, so again, I would just highlight that, listen to these stories and realize that these are not isolated incidents, that this is um this is something that concerns every single member of humanity and how much so, um, how much more so um, recognizing the, the implications that this has for the sovereignty um, of each nation and, and the future of the free world as a whole. So again, with that, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from Jevlon and to engaging in conversation afterwards, but please hear what Uyghurs are saying. It's really quite that simple. Thank you, Julie for a very, very convincing bit. Uh, next with us is Mr. Jivlin Shermamet. He is a Uyghur activist in Turkey. He is the son of Surya Tursun, who was detained in concentration camps. He is a graduate from Istanbul Commerce University Law Faculty. 
Over to you, Jiblin. Thank you, uh, thank you for giving me this chance for speaking of uh, for my family, and I'm very uh, happy uh, joining this platform. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jiblin uh, Shirmanmet. Uh, I'm uh, uh, I came to Turkey for my education in 2011, uh, and then I just, uh, in the 2012 I enrolled in Istanbul Kumar University Law Faculty, and then in 2018 uh, I have graduated from there. Uh, during my student times uh, in the university, a, every uh, winter and the summer vacation I have been to the, my family and been to East Turkestan for visiting my family. Uh, uh, last time uh, I visited my family in the 2016 uh, October, it's my last time I come to uh, Turkey. Yeah. Uh, since then, I haven't been to uh, go back again visiting my family uh, because, you know, in the, uh, from the 2016, actually from the 2017, no one in the diaspora, no Uyghur, can go back uh, to East Turkestan for visiting their family. Uh, most of we were uh, have lost in touch with uh, their family um, more than five years, four years. For example, it's me. Uh, since 2018 in January, I haven't, uh, I, I have not been able to contact with my family. Uh, in in the two years, uh, I haven't got any info uh, from the, my family and about my family. In the 2019 uh, December, I had got info about my family uh, from the uh, some relationship, and then uh, they told me uh, my parents and my uh, my parents and my brother, younger brother, were detained into the concentration camps. Uh, the reason is I'm studying in Turkey. Uh, and that you know, uh, the, the, from the 2000 and before the 2018, you know, the Chinese uh, authority and the Chinese regime, actually, uh, they haven't, uh, uh, except uh, there is uh, camps, there is a uh, concentration camps. So they, uh, every time they said that there is no some uh, camps uh, like uh, you uh, talk about the uh, concentration camps. Every time Chinese uh, representative and the Ch Chinese authority. Uh, uh, told this, uh, they, they refused that there is a concentration camp, there are concentration camps. But uh, from the 2018, uh, you know, uh, August, uh, there is a report uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, you know, United Nations, it told that more than 1 million and the, uh, 1 million and 5, uh, uh, 100,000 uh, Uyghur uh, were detained into the concentration camps. At that time, the Chinese authorities said that uh, there is no concentration camp. This is an education center. We educated some people, who, some Uyghur people who need some education. And then we told them uh, the Chinese language, we told them uh, uh, law. Uh, blah, blah, you know, uh, this is a Chinese ex excuse, Chinese regime's excuse. But uh, I just uh, want to uh, talk to my family members, my parents. My parents uh, working for Chinese government more than uh, uh, 30, year, 30 years as a civil servant. Uh, my, my, my mother is an accountant working, uh, work, uh, she was working in uh, Trident Industry Department in the, our hometown. And then my uh, father also working uh, more than 30 years uh, as a uh, uh, environment pro uh, protector uh, working for environment uh, protection uh, ministry and then the the post don't need any educated what the chinese uh, authority told you know uh, they, they can speak a chinese language very well and they know chinese law and my my brother also uh, she has uh, he has graduated from the chinese university in the, in the lanzhou and that uh, she is an engineer and then she also working in the as a custom in the uh, uh, kazakhstan and the you know our uh, my hometown uh, korgas county uh, border 
uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyz, what kind of educated they need. So uh, Chinese uh, Chinese authority always lied in the world. They said that we told these people uh, something, some excuse and the education. That they lie because my parents also is an example. And Mr. Arkins did also told, and Mr. Uh, uh, Isha Hassan uh, also told that their their family member also they don't need any ed educated just like my parents. So when I uh, when I learned this info about my family and then I uh, just trying to uh, contact uh, trying to contact them with the Chinese embassy embassy in the Ankara and the Chinese consulate also Chinese uh, foreigner office in the Beijing let them helping me contact with my family let them helping me give me some info about my family but they just keeping their uh, dead silence they haven't responded to my question and then after that I decided to speak out to the world I know. Uh, when I begin to speak out, maybe I will face some dangers. Maybe I will face some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, uh, dangerous on the something difficult in the Turkey. I know, but uh, I decided speaking out because uh, I I need my family because uh, I have to save my family. After my speaking out on the social media and the di uh, different. Uh, platform in a uh, different platform uh, speak out for my parents uh, after the two months uh, I began to after the two months uh, uh, since I began to speak after I have got a threatened phone call uh, from the Chinese uh, diplomat in the Ch in the uh, Istanbul uh, uh, he's uh, they called me and threatened me. I need to stop the speaking out. I need I need to stop the talking to the journalist. Uh, and then uh, he said, if I uh, prove myself to the Ch uh, Chinese Communist Party, maybe that time uh, I can get the help from them. Maybe that time I can contact him with my family. Maybe I can that time I uh, I can uh, save my mom because uh, the my. Uh, my some relationship told me that my my father and my brother uh, uh, was released after the, the, the detainment after the two years, and my mom still in the concentration camp. So because the reason is that she came to Turkey for visiting me. Uh, so uh, Chinese uh, authority, Chinese diplomat, threatened me. Let that let me stop. Uh, Maybe that time I can contact him with my father, my brother, and then my, I can save my mom. But I haven't stopped because because this 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 I I do some mistake, and then so I have to prove myself uh, to the Communist Party. Uh, if I told what uh, who is my my relationship, who is my uh, my friends in the Istanbul, who I am talking, what kind of relationship is what kind of. Uh, you know, organization maybe that them be uh, helping me. And the meaning is that they want to me, me be a spy for them. That time I can, uh, that time I can contact with my, uh, parent, uh, my with my family, and I, that time I can, maybe I can save my mom. But I'm nonstop. I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting. Uh, one time the Chinese police uh, take my father to the police station, let my father call me, stop my campaign for saving my mom, and then threaten my family, threaten my mother, uh, my father, my uh, brother, and my uncle, let me stop the, my activity for my mom, but I'm non-stop. I'm still fighting. So it's my final word. My, uh, can, you, can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine? But in, in the modern day, in the modern day, every can can contact everyone in the world, uh, even uh, even uh, some uh, country also have some you know you know can contact them in the outside the earth, you know. But me, but me, I couldn't even I couldn't contact them with my family five years. I don't know what. What is my parents, my family's situation? Three months ago, I have got the info from from the, my grandma. My, I about my grandma three months ago. It told me my grandma have passed away three years ago. But just three months ago, I have got this info. This is my situation. This is a Uyghur situation in the diaspora, and then you know. Uh, after the months, maybe it's not one month. After the uh, fifteen days, there 
there is the Olympic, uh, Peking Olympic, uh, the China will hold the Peking Olympic, a Winter Olympic. And some of country uh, send their representative delegation, uh, diplomatic delegation to the uh, Olympic. And then, you know, uh, they will come, uh, yeah, uh, they will share Olympic with the Chinese regime. I just want to hold this country. If you go to the, if you're supporting China, hold the, uh, this uh, Olymp Olympic, if you support it, if you go to the China and then share this Olympic, that meaning is that you support in China committed genocide to Uyghur people. You support in China rape Uyghur women. You support in China kill Uyghur children, assimilate the Uyghur children. You also support in China detain my mom, torture my torture to my mom. You support in China ruin my ruin my family, you support in China, ruin all Uyghur family, Uyghur culture. So if if, if this country go to the, uh, you send a representative to the, diplomatic representative to the China, you have to thinking about this. You have to think, think in China committed genocide. You know, if you don't, if you don't do some real action, that meaning is that you're supporting China, right? That, Maybe that comes that other dictator will fall in China. What if will fall in China do the same thing? The world already, the world is humanity ready for facing this darkness world, ready for facing this any country, any dictator country come to the same thing, same again, same crime against humanity to the other nations. This is my final word. Thank you. Thank you, Jeblin, for a very enriching account of your experiences and your perspective on the matter. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Sento, there is yeah, a sure, little sure. Yeah, addition, uh, addition. You know, please, uh, please. In, uh, last year, 2020, when the Amnesty International have a report, uh, report about the uh, uh, Chinese regime have a separate uh, more than 500,000 Uyghur children from their family. You know this report. Can you imagine after the 10 years, after the 10 years, the yeah, Chinese uh, regime will teach these children, more than 500 million children, Uyghur children, without their parents educated, without uh, their uh, cultural, without their religion. After the 10 years, can, can you imagine Maybe they will change a killer machine for the Chinese uh, army. Maybe they will do some. They will do some, uh, you know, operation in the different country or the different world. These Uyghur children as a Chinese army uh, killer machine. Can you imagine this? Yes, this is my final word. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zevlan. So now we will move on to the question and answer part of our discussion. So there have been some questions that have been received over mail beforehand. And there are some questions which are specified for our speakers. And there are some which have been left open for general discussion. So first, I'll just proceed with the general questions. Anyone amongst you can choose to answer. First question is, what could be the role of international organizations like UN Red Cross in preventing the, the genocide or the tortures that the Uyghur community has been facing? What is your take on this? Anyone amongst you can choose to answer. Yeah, let me start with this. Uh, UN already uh, under the Chinese uh, control. UN, when it was set up in after Second World War, we know in UN chapter, it says uh, for the humanity to keep the peace, to protect the vulnerable, uh, especially after the Holocaust, we had, uh, after UN set up, we had the Declaration of the Human Rights, and then in 1948, the 
prevention and uh, punishment of the genocide, the second um, uh, international convention. And uh, you promised never again. The never again is means the Holocaust, never again. But since then, we had many, many, but now the biggest one. And uh, uh, it's very, very irony and also very saddening. Uh, the Secretary of the UN, Mr. Anthony, will go to the Olympic, sitting with Xi Jinping to enjoying the Uyghurs 